Hello and welcome to our webinar. My name is Steve Lay from the Department of Chemistry at Cambridge University in the UK. We're going to be reporting to you today on a collaboration that we've had with Metala Toledo on the development of a new REACT IR45M flow cell. And we're going to specifically be focusing on using this device then for continuous processing technology but we will also address wider issues and also show you that indeed the device can be used for various batch mode applications as well. But let me begin by introducing my team to you since they will be presenting the main part of the lecture concerning the particular applications of the new device. We'll start by asking Catherine Carter to present her work that she's been doing after the last few weeks on this new machinery, and then move on to Heiko Langer, who will also present his work uh, using the new equipment. But first of all, we'd like to address the agenda for the webinar with you on the next slide. Let me begin with a, an introduction and coming from our agenda then. Um, I will make a few comments, I think, about flow chemistry and to introduce some of the areas where we think these new tools and devices will be particularly attractive. Uh, we'll also give you some idea of the technical details, although there will be plenty of opportunity to ask further questions later. And indeed, I am quite sure that if you would like to follow up with email to either ourselves or to our Metala Toledo uh, contacts, we'd be very happy to, uh, to answer these for you. What we will then move on to are some of the very specific applications. And you will notice there's really quite a wide range of some eight applications that we've been able to achieve over a relatively short period of time. We're going to define some questions, some key questions that we think we would need to address if this new device is going to be particularly useful to us. And I hope by the end, at the conclusions, you will uh, see that we have answered at least most of these questions. And I think we'd like to leave you with a little bit of an outlook of where we think there will be future opportunities and where this science might move forward. But the first picture that you see on this slide should give you some idea of just how compact the unit is and indeed how easy it is and would be easy to incorporate into many laboratory environments. I want to begin, though, by talking about some as we see them, advantages of flow chemistry. I'm not going to cover all these advantages, but certainly let's talk about some of the issues where we think we're getting improved levels of control. I think the flow chemistry is certainly able to much better control temperature and mixing of chemical reactions. And temperature and mixing are absolutely vital to good organic synthesis. We can expect, I think, a high degree of improved safety when dealing with flow chemistry, since we're able to contain hazardous reaction intermediates. And particularly, we are only making relatively small amounts of material at any one time, and then using them in a second step or third step of the synthesis process. So I'd like you to think of it very much more as a sort of make and use concept. We can make what we want, when we want, in the purity and in the quantity that we need in real time. And that certainly has advantages, I think, for synthesis into the future. We can also anticipate, using flow chemistry methods, that we're going to have greatly improved reaction profiles. And if we can achieve this, then we can also anticipate higher yields from our reactions, and without doubt, we're going to capture very much more understanding about our reaction processes, especially so if we're able to get structural information. And if we're able to do this, of course, it will also aid us in linking in our flow streams inline purification, and therefore avoiding many of the downstream workup processes and, and unit operations common to multi-step syntheses. So inline purification and workup is a crucial component of what we're trying to achieve with flow chemistry. You could also anticipate a high degree of automation is going to become possible. 
We don't always like to think of it as automation. I think we would much prefer to think of it as machine-assisted synthesis, since we are really using the machines in a working environment uh, to aid us in all the synthesis processes uh, that we would like to bring into play. Also, we, of course, will be concentrating on telescoping of processes together, the ability to be able to carry out then multi-steps on single uh, flow units. So far, we're able to do this, and indeed, we have even gone up to seven discrete chemical steps. And this will, of course, and does require a great deal of inline analysis as we progress from one step to another step. Let's, however, talk about some of the challenges of continuous flow chemistry, because there are certainly some considerable challenges. I think we would say one of the biggest being, of course, real-time inline monitoring is significant for us. Uh, in, indeed, if we can control real inline monitoring, we're much better able to deal with multi-step synthesis sequences. And therefore, this does produce technical problems. We would certainly like to get better information, for example, concerning dispersion and diffusion, which are unavoidable side effects uh, of continuous flow processing. We'd also like to get some more chemical information, particularly information as it would relate to reaction monitoring. And traditionally, we might consider taking offline sampling so that TLC and LCMS can give us information. But these don't really give us structural information. And indeed, inline monitoring would very much greatly assist us, and especially so if we are optimizing chemical processes. And the details coming from infrared would give us that higher level of structural information. Also chemically, I think we would like to have information as the reaction proceeds and to understand a little better the stability maybe of reaction intermediates or can we get more intimate knowledge of, say, catalytic turnovers, for example, and discrete catalytic uh, intermediates in reaction profiles. This would really, really help us in our, in our further chemical design, but they are very significant challenges with the sort of techniques that we have today. To illustrate this, for example, if we were to use UV monitoring, which is pretty well the only detection technique currently available for inline monitoring as we have it today, there are significant problems and limitations. Obviously, not all compounds have a UV signature that we can make use of. And often, the UV bands are not terribly specific. And if you have mixtures of compounds, then, of course, it becomes very easy to, uh, very difficult to distinguish between those compounds without having diode array or further levels of analysis. So I think this really does tell us that infrared spectroscopy has, in principle, much wider application. And indeed, we would argue very much improved specificity since it's giving us this additional structural information, which we can then obtain and obviously deconvolute by various computational or manipulative methods. So to begin with the React IR flow cell, and just to give you some of the technical details uh, of this particular device. You will see that we are using the React IR 45M body, uh, and that's being fitted with a mercury cadmium telluride detector. So very similar to the sort of conventional flow probe uh, machinery, IR machinery that we are familiar with. So it really also accommodates the same sort of software uh, control. The flow cell is an attenuated total reflectance diamond sensor. Uh, that, of course, gives us very good coverage in the infrared spectral regions, uh, particularly from 650 to about 950 centimeters, 91, 90 centimeters minus 1, and 250 to 4,000 centimeters to the minus 1. But there is a blind spot. There is a gap in what we're able to analyze using the diamond probe. And if you look at the diagram at the bottom, you can see that uh, clearly indicated. Nevertheless, with our Metla Toledo colli colleagues, we will be developing a silicon cell 
and hopefully that will come, overcome that problem uh, and uh, give us the opportunity for measuring spectra in that particular region. The unit has a very easily removed head. It's simply bolted on with Allen keys to screw the unit. As you can see from the bottom hand right diagram, it can be unscrewed very rapidly and indeed easily cleaned uh, in just a few seconds. And we also see that as a real advantage uh, to this particular piece of equipment. The head itself can be heated. Uh, we have it tested up to 60 degrees at this present time, and it can stand pressures up to about 30 bars or so. So fairly adaptable in terms of temperature and pressure ranges, which fits really quite nicely with much of our flow chemistry equipment. It's easily connected through an OmniFit connections, and we can connect it to really any one of our continuous chemistry flow platforms. And as I mentioned before, the software that we are using here, the operating system, is very much one that we are familiar with, with our normal React R, IR, and data analysis control. I said that we would want to think of some applications, but before doing that, there are certainly some questions I think we need to ask. And I would hope these would be questions that you would recognize yourselves, and I'm sure there are others that you might want to address. But these were our first pass of questions that we certainly wanted the new device to be able to solve. And I hope by the end of the talks, you will see that we have indeed, I think, answered most of these questions as well. So what can we couple these devices to? Indeed, we have almost every type of commercially available flow chemistry uh, unit within my laboratories. And indeed, I think we can now say that we can connect this to almost any of that type of machinery. But it was relevant that it would be versatile and robust in almost any environment. We also want to know, can we monitor and use this unit for long periods of time? And by that, I think we would say at least up to 24 hours. So it does need to be robust, at least for that period of time, before maybe uh, it would need any further attention. We'd also like to be able to use it for various screening programs. And I, I do mean this in the widest sense, screening maybe for catalysts, for reagents, or even screening for new chemical methods, uh, and indeed for compound screening as well, structural screening. And can we get information using this flow device about the actual reaction intermediates? Will it help us delineate reaction mechanisms? These are certainly things that would help us in our synthesis planning and give us much more information than we traditionally collect by the typical batch mode chemistry that we operate today. We also have to ask an important question of how sensitive is the device? Uh, what, in fact, are the minimum reaction concentrations that we might think of? This becomes particularly relevant if we're wanting to measure low levels of catalysts, for example, in synthesis procedures. And we would also like to ask the question of can we actually monitor batch reactions in a more convenient uh, fashion using the new machinery? And indeed, we might end up with a final question of what else could we use it for. It's certainly a compact device and certainly something that we think is very flexible and easily to reconfigure. I'll now hand over to Catherine Carter, one of my students, who will now tell you about some of the work that she's been doing in terms of applications of the new equipment. Thank you very much, Steve. The first application we want to discuss is the use of the IR flow cell to gain information about product dispersion, one of the main problems we alluded to earlier. The setup required for this was to attach the flow cell to the output of a flow chemistry system, as you can see in the schematic diagram and accompanying photo. This would then monitor the manner in which the product leaves the reactor. We chose three reliable flow chemistry procedures to test this. The first was a fluorination protocol. Aldehyde 1 is combined in a T-piece with dust, and the reaction stream passed through a CFC coil held at 80 degrees C. 
the fluorination takes place in this coil, and then the scavenging column containing calcium carbonate and silica gel provides an inline quench and purification system. The reaction stream then exits this column and goes through the IR flow cell where it's monitored. Before carrying out any reaction with the REACT IR, it is beneficial to take library spectra of the reagents. These spectra can then be compared with the raw data to ascertain which peaks are present or missing. Once this is carried out, the reaction is simply run and the machine programmed to take scans every 30 seconds. The graph on the left shows a zoomed in region of the raw spectra in the region of 1200 wave numbers where we were expecting the carbon fluorine bond vibration in the product to occur. As you can see, after 65 minutes, the first product starts entering the cell. This time represents the residence time within the flow reactor. After 77 minutes, the bulk of the material is seen flowing through, and after 95 minutes, all the product has been fully collected. This raw spectrum can be converted into a trend graph that you can see on the right, displaying the data as a function of the monitored peak's intensity over time. The first piece of useful information you can see from this is that our scavenging system is working really nicely as there's no trace of aldehyde remaining. The most useful information for flow chemists that comes out of this graph concerns the product dispersion. The reaction consisted of a 4 milliliter solution being pumped at a flow rate of 0.2 mils per minute. Based on this, you would expect 20 minutes to be required to collect the product. This is portion A of the graph. What you actually see is that it takes 36 minutes for the product to be fully collected due to the diffusion and dispersion effects discussed earlier. This is invaluable information for flow chemists because if we wanted to add a third stream to meet the outgoing product with a one-to-one -one stoichiometry, the flow rate would have to be considerably adjusted from 0.2 mils per minute to ensure that the new stream meets all of this material. Normally, UV detectors are used to measure dispersion, however, they suffer from a lack of specificity as discussed earlier. The second example we chose to investigate dispersion was another fluorination protocol, this time with ester 4. In this case, any unreacted ester would not be scavenged by the cleanup column, so we wanted to see if we could measure the levels of unreacted starting material remaining in solution. As you can see from the trend graph, both the product and unreactive ester are detected by the IR flow cell. This example is particularly interesting because of the time delay, C, between the product entering the cell and the unreacted ester entering the cell. This is a direct representation of the chromatographic effect of having a silica gel column in line. What we could then do is determine very accurately the amount of silica gel required for the product to be completely eluted and the ester to remain on the column, effectively carrying out a chromatographic separation in line. The final example for measuring product dispersion was an oxazole formation reaction. In this procedure, acid chloride 6 is mixed with isocyanide 7 in a glass chip before being passed through a column of solid-supported BEMP, a strong phosphazine base, to carry out the cyclization. The benzylamine resin then acts as a scavenger for any unreacted acid chloride, which is used in excess to drive the reaction to completion. The IR cell was then attached to the output of the setup as described before, as you can see in the picture on the bottom left. As the trend graph shows, again, the scavenging system is very effective, with no surplus acid chloride remaining. One particularly interesting feature observed here is the considerable dispersive effect of having two scavenging columns in line instead of one that we used for the two previous examples. Despite being pumped at 0.4 mils per minute, double the flow rate of the fluorination reactions, the product oxazole still required a full 30 minutes to be collected rather than the expected 10 minutes based on the reaction volume and flow rate. Once again, this would be invaluable information if this reaction was to be used in a multi-step sequence. The next application of the IR flow cell we investigated was the real-time monitoring of hydrogenation reactions. We chose the saturation of methyl nicotinate 9 on the H cube MIDI as a suitable example. This would enable us to test how the flow cell performs under fast flow rates 
and also to see if we could still gain useful information about a reaction with a solvent system that has a very high absorbance profile, i.e. ethanol and water. To incorporate the IR flow cell, we designed a recycling setup shown in the schematic below, whereby the pump in the H cube MIDI withdraws the reaction mixture from the flask through the cell and into the reactor, and then the product is returned to the same flask. The first thing we wanted to do before carrying out the reaction was perform a concentration screen, as hydrogenations are typically carried out at high dilutions. We tested concentrations from 1 molar to 0.01 molar, and as you can see, using the very effective solvent subtraction feature in the software, appreciable information can still be obtained at 0.01 molar, even for the more weakly absorbing carbon-carbon double bonds. This solvent subtraction can also be applied to the raw data in real time. The reaction itself proceeded successfully. As you can see from the trend graph, we observed the clear formation of the product and consumption of the starting material. One nice feature was that we were able to monitor the unconjugated and conjugated esters separately as their wave numbers were significantly different. We believe it is beneficial in this case to monitor more than one functional group within a molecule, particularly for weak bonds at high dilution as this validates the results and ensures you are not simply monitoring the background noise. The graph spiking that you can see is a not yet fully explained artifact of the setup. However, we believe it may be due to the pump withdrawing material at a very fast flow rate through the cell and a partial vacuum could be created. Another application that could be used here is the potential for quantitative analysis. You could take a sample offline at any point in the reaction and determine the conversion. Using the software, it is then possible to couple that conversion with the peak intensity at that time. So the relative intensity scale that you can see on the left of the graph becomes a conversion scale, which would be really beneficial for reaction planning. The second example of this kind of setup is the hydrogenation of butane 2,3-diacetyl alkene 11 to the mesodiaster 12 with the H cube. The graph on the right shows a zoom in of the raw spectra around the region of the double bond in the alkene, and you can clearly see the peak disappearing over time. The trend graph is shown on the left. Although there are peaks and troughs in the trend, possibly due to fluctuations in the performance of the H cube, you can still gain useful information about the progress of the reaction. One incident worth mentioning here is that although the reaction seemed to be complete by IR, it was 80% conversion by proton spectroscopy. This is probably due to the fact that the reaction was run at very low concentration, and the levels of residual starting material could simply not be measured. So as a general best practice, we recommend to extrapolate the graphs in order to estimate the time needed for full conversion. One thing that we talk about a lot with continuous flow chemistry is the ability to do fast optimi optimization by simply flowing your reaction mixture through the setup and changing the reaction parameters, as it is fresh material being processed all the time. This is certainly true. However, a sample still has to be taken offline and analyzed after every change is made. It would be much more attractive and time efficient to have an inline monitoring device that could track the changes. To try and test this application, we chose the butane 2,3 diacetyl protection of chloropropane diol 13, which occurs in a heated coil to give BDA protected derivative 15. The IR was attached at the output of the reactor as described before, and the temp temperature changed on the fly. As you can see from the trend graph, an increase in peak intensity with temperature was observed, which corresponds to the batch screening carried out for this substrate. Every time the temperature was increased, we waited to see a steady state in the IR before changing it again. In this way, many parameters could be rapidly evaluated and analyzed relative to each other. We believe this is a very efficient way to quickly obtain fast qualitative screening information. Using these optimized conditions, we then ran this experiment on a very large scale over 24 hours using the IR flow cell as a continuous quality control device. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Heiko Langer, who will explain the remaining applications. Thank you very much, Catherine. 
Within the next slides, we now wish to present the possibility of connecting the new IR flow cell to a microfluidic device in order to perform a screening experiment on a much smaller scale than before, using minimal amounts of material and thereby covering a broad spectrum of reaction conditions with respect to temperature and residence time. The microfluidic flow chemistry platform chosen here consists of a 10 microliter glass reactor chip into which the substrate streams are pumped using two conventional programmable syringe pumps. The reaction temperature is both controlled and monitored using a Peltier element and a temperature control unit as shown in the picture on the bottom right. The reactor IR flow cell was then attached in line at the end of the flow stream. Again, we operate the IR flow cell using a back pressure regulator, here only 40 psi due to the pumps in order to obtain optimal results. The reaction we chose to investigate this microscale screening was a diastereoselective chain elongation according to Marshall's protocols, using cyclohexyl carbaldehyde number 16, chiral stannulated allene number 17, and a Lewis acid here BF3 etherate. Having found optimal reaction conditions, we were able to monitor formation of the desired product alkyne 18, as indicated by the green line in the graphic at the bottom right of the slide. At the same time, we can clearly see the decay of the band at 1721 cm to the minus 1, belonging to the carboxyl carbaldehyde starting material, and the decay of the band at 1368 cm to the minus 1, indicating the consumption of the starting allene. The reaction performed turned out to be actually much faster than originally anticipated and to be much more robust than we thought. The 3D plot on the left indicates this quite impressively, as you can see the very rapid increase of the intensity of the band corresponding to the CO bond stretch of our, our desired alkyne number 18. However, in this particular case, we have to mention the intrinsic time delay that was observed between the variation of a screening parameter and the monitoring of the effect this change caused. This time delay is due to the fact that the volume of the currently used flow cell is five times the volume of the glass reactor chip. However, as Metler Toledo is currently developing a 10 microliter flow cell, this problem will be rendered meaningless in future setups in which the flow cell is attached to a microfluidic device like this. Besides, we cross-validated the screening results by more conventional analysis tools, again rendering this intrinsic time delay more or less unimportant. As Steve has mentioned earlier, we were also interested to check whether we can actually monitor reactive intermediates using this new inline monitoring device, as this would allow us to examine reactions in even more detail than before and to elucidate mechanisms. In order to see whether we can monitor intermediates, we performed a curtius rearrangement in flow, following the procedure as published earlier last year. The only modification to the setup published was that we attached the IR flow cell in line between two CFC reactors as it is shown in the schematic drawing on the top left and in the picture on the right. We were hoping to be able to monitor the intermediate SLA site, which is initially formed in this reaction and which is then subsequently uh, undergoing a rearrangement to the intermediate isocyanate, which is then trapped with the allyl alcohol as a nucleophile to form the final product carbamate 21. Being aware of the fact that we will not be able to see the isocyanate at all, as the band corresponding to the isocyanide stretch lies within the blind region of the diamond-based flow cell, we were hoping to see the SLA site intermediate via the IR bands generated by the stretch of its carbonyl moiety. As we did not really know at which temperature we could observe the SLA site properly using its carbonyl band, we performed a rapid in-cell temperature screen in order to optimize the conditions for monitoring, making use of the fact that we can heat the flow cell head. After having loaded the IR flow cell with the reaction mixture, just by using a conventional plastic syringe, we simply monitored the reaction as it is progressed in the cell. As you can see in the graphic on this slide, the SLA that is steadily formed at room temperature, although very slowly. It takes approximately 18 minutes until the available peak maximum is reached. Heating the head to 40 degrees results in a much faster formation of SLA Z22. The maximum peak height was reached after 6 to 8 minutes. The green line further indicates here that at this temperature the SLA Z is stable enough to be monitored. Running a third in-cell experiment with the cell being heated up to 60 degrees, we see that at this temperature the SLA Z cannot be monitored anymore. We assume that at this temperature the rearrangement process starts, making it impossible to see the SLA Z intermediate. 
Having found optimal conditions for monitoring the SLA site, we performed three experiments to elucidate the possibilities to monitor this reactive intermediate in line in flow. The results are outlined on this slide. Within the first experiment, the flow cell was attached in line between the two flow coils, as mentioned before, and the first coil was heated up to 40 degrees in order to ensure a complete formation of the SLA site, whereas the second one was heated to 120 degrees in order to drive the reaction to final completion. As it now can be seen out of the green graph, the SLA site is indeed formed and we can monitor its dispersion curve as we did before within the first set of experiments explained by Catherine. Within the second experiment, we kept the experimental setup as it was, but we heated the first coil from 40 degrees up to 120 degrees, forcing the rearrangement process to take place within the first coil. This commencing rearrangement process could be monitored as the red graph indicates. At the beginning, we still see the SLA site, but with increase of the temperature, the peak intensity drops down to a certain steady state level, indicating the desired rearrangement process within the first coil took indeed place. The third experiment was then performed simply in order to ensure that our erection setup in total delivers the desired carbon May 21. Hence, we attached the flow cell at the end of our erection arrangement. We now were indeed able to monitor carbon May 21 via its carbonyl band at 17.23 centimeters to the minus one. Besides, we can see that there is no SLA site left within the exiting reaction stream as the red graph is a flat line. Employing the double-headed cell presented on the website advertising this webinar, simultaneous monitoring of both the reactive intermediate and the product is possible. Being encouraged by all these results, we wanted to go on and go the next step further to try monitoring aryl azides in line, as these represent another kind of hazardous but important intermediates. Besides, we were particularly interested in its monitoring due to an ongoing project in our group, in which an aniline derivative is transformed into an aryl azide by reacting it with terbutyl nitride in the presence of TMS azide, just as it is outlined here on the upper left. We were hoping to see aryl azides in spite of the fact that their main signals lie within the blind region of the cell, as we noticed a small region in that blind region, indicated by the blue square within the graphic, in which some absorption is possible. However, we were, to be honest, very lucky in this case. Another issue which we were aiming to address by running this particular experiment was to check whether the new IR flow cell can deal with substantial amounts of gas which are produced as a byproduct and which are observed as plaques of gas between plaques of product containing solution. Here, nitrogen gas is formed in stoichiometric amounts as you might see in the picture on the flow coils on the right. Firstly, the results obtained clearly indicate that it is absolutely no issue to have gas bubbles within your reaction stream being monitored. More interestingly, however, the results obtained indicate that we are indeed able to monitor the aryl azide as intended. Comparing the raw data displayed on the right of the slide with the library spectrum of TMS azide displayed as green dots, we can state that there is no TMS azide left but that the new band occurring at 21.17 cm to the minus 1 reflects the successful formation of aryl azide 24, as was cross-validated by our conventional analysis tools like proton NMR spectroscopy. As we always intend to perform an inline purification as an essential part of our flow synthesis protocols, we designed a scaffolding system in order to get rid of all the azide containing residues within the reactor output, in this case, namely TMS azide. The scaffolding protocol outlined at the top of the slide consists of two steps. First, we intend to convert the remaining unreacted TMS azide into HN3 by passing it through a column filled with polymer supported acid. Then we pass the whole stream, which hopefully now contains HN3, through a column filled with polymer-supported base, which is supposed to catch the intermediately formed HN3 by forming a polymer-supported azide salt, rendering the flow stream azide-free. In order to validate this scavenging procedure, we use the new IR flow cell. As you can see on the right, upon passing a stream containing TMS azide just through a column filled with polymer-supported acid, we could monitor a qu new quite strong band appearing and decaying over time in the TMS azide region at 11.75 cm to the minus 1, but being significantly different from the band corresponding to TMS azide itself. We anticipated that this band corresponds to HN3. This assumption could be cross-validated by performing a control experiment in which we deliberately formed HN3 in flow by reacting sodium azide with hydrochloric acid in an aqueous solution, 
Again, we could monitor the band at 11.75 centimeters to the minus 1. Now, as we know where the bands for TMS azide in HM3 occur, we could finally validate our scavenging protocol using the cell, as it is shown on this slide. The red line monitoring peak heights at 11.75 cm to the minus 1 remains flat when passing a solution of TMS azide through a column of polymer supported acid followed by a column of polymer supported base. This clearly shows both that the azide scavenging works and that the IR flow cell can be used as an inline detection device for monitoring these toxic materials. As most of the anilines used within this general flow reaction are toxic, we were also keen to scavenge those in case the reaction doesn't go to completion or reactor failure causes problems. We were pleased to find that the IR flow cell could also be used in order to detect those compounds and thereby be used as a detection device to monitor the scavenging procedure addressing these leftover starting materials. As you can see on this slide, the reaction setup without having an aniline scavenging column in line produces an output which contains residual aniline 23. Placing an appropriate scavenging column in line results in a clean product stream free of aniline as detected by the cell. Within the raw data displayed on the right, there is no signal whatsoever that would indicate the presence of the aniline when compared to the aniline reference spectrum. As Steve has outlined before, we were also able to successfully monitor batch reactions with the new IR flow cell. We find this application of the flow cell especially advantageous in those cases in which the reaction scale is too small for using the conventional fiber optic probe. The picture on this slide shows you how we use the flow cell in order to monitor a batch reaction without disturbing the reaction itself any more than necessary. The reaction flask is connected to the flow cell via a fine PTFE tubing with an inner diameter of 0.5 mm. The same tubing is used to connect the flow cell to a 1 ml glass syringe which is operated via a conventional programmable syringe pump. The pump was programmed to constantly withdraw and re-inject 200 microliters of the reaction mixture through the cell from or into the reaction vessel, respectively. This setup also allows for monitoring batch reactions in an inert atmosphere and at different temperatures. The reaction we chose was a peptide coupling reaction. We think that this is a representative example of a batch reaction which requires constant monitoring as the reaction times might vary significantly according to the starting amino acid derivatives and the coupling reagent chosen. Additionally, this example is quite challenging to monitor since the substances used should display very similar IR spectra. Besides, an activated intermediate is formed which again contains similar functional groups. We choose to couple CBZ and TBS protected serine 25 to leucine methylate 26 in the presence of PIOAP as coupling reagent to form known dipeptide 27 in a very good 95% yield. As you can see from the graph displayed on the right, we can indeed monitor batch reactions as complicated as this one using the setup just outlined. We do see steady product formation indicated by the blue plot. We do see the immediate formation of the anticipated intermediate activated ester 28 once the coupling reagent has been added, as indicated by the green graph. Besides, we can monitor a decay of the signal connected to the starting leucine derivative 26. However, at the first glance, the concentration of the activated ester seems to stay constant over time, although the product is obviously formed. Using the 3D analysis tool, which is incorporated in the software, we were able to investigate and so to explain this observation quite neatly. As you can hopefully see, the seemingly constant concentration of the activated ester 28 within the reaction mixture is due to the fact that the band obtained for this activated ester at 1681 centimeters to the minus 1 and the band obtained for the ester carbonyl functionality in the newly formed amide 27 at 1650 centimeters to the 1 overlie each other to some extent. Within the 3D pictures, you can now clearly see that the intensity of the band of the activated ester is decreasing to the same extent as the intensity of the band corresponding to the product is increasing. This becomes even more apparent when further rotating the 3D plots using the software. At this point, we would now like to conclude the results obtained using the new React IR flow cell. One of the most important points is that we can couple it with all the different flow chemistry platforms we currently have in our laboratories, namely micro and mesofluidic devices, the H-cube, and even the H-cube MIDI, 
which represents the ZEMI production scale piece of equipment. We can use the new IR flow cell as a continuous quality control device, which allows for easy detection of both reaction and reactor failures. We can use it for fast screenings, again using it in connection with both micro and mesoscale flow chemistry devices. Rapid in-cell screenings are possible as well when you just want to screen temperature effects. We can quite easily obtain information about reactive intermediates. This will indeed be very useful to further analyze reactions with respect to mechanistic understanding. Even when these reactive intermediates are unknown in terms of their IR spectroscopic characteristics, the new IR flow cell is sensitive enough to make it possible to delineate the signals out of the raw data. The IR flow cell is quite sensitive in general. We were able to monitor substances down to a concentration level of around 0.01 molar. Here, the solvent subtraction feature is particularly helpful. Current efforts are also aiming at a further refinement of the optics. We can indeed use the new flow cell to monitor batch reactions. A simple withdraw and re-inject procedure using a programmable syringe pump is all you need. What else can we use it for? Well, Catherine showed at the beginning that we can easily monitor dispersion and diffusion effects caused by the reaction setups. This should now allow us to trigger pumps and other equipment and to further synchronize different flow platforms. That will greatly assist in achieving an optimized telescoping of numerous steps in flow. Last but not least, we could use the IR flow cell as a valuable inline detector for toxic azides and toxic anilines. All these results just presented in this webinar are summarized in a paper as well, which has just been submitted for publication. Let me now hand over to Steve again, as he will give us an outlook about where we might go with this new tool for real-time inline analysis. I said at the start we'd like to address finally with you some outlook and future opportunities of this new flow cell device. And so let me end the presentations with just a few comments that I'd like to make about where we think we are uh, to this date and, and indeed uh, how far we think this might progress into the future. Certainly for us, the capabilities of the new device are really very attractive. It has become a very powerful piece of equipment in a relatively short period of time. And so we have been very fast to get good value. And I think the software that we've been using is fairly intuitive. And we really haven't had to go through extensive training period to become really quite competent at running the machinery. Also, I think we can genuinely say that it's very really easily accommodated and incorporated into synthesis equipment and flow chemistry machinery. It's certainly very versatile and very, very convenient to use. I think that another point that we would say about an outlook is that it's capable, we believe, of remote site monitoring and control. And this is very much part of our thinking uh, for future labs, the lab of the future concept, if you like. We, we would like to be able to collect information and be able to port it, it maybe even on through to our cell phones and consider remote site monitoring and control. And I think this will certainly be part of the 24-hour, seven-day laboratory working environment into the future. And, and this device, I think, really will play an excellent role in uh, allowing us to do that type of monitoring and control. And I think if I was to make an end with one prediction, I think both in terms of an, as an academic, but also I think we could now comment that we believe in the industrial environment also. We would say that this will certainly become a routine piece of laboratory kit. So with that, I, I hope you've enjoyed what we've been talking to you about today. We'd be very happy, of course, to answer any of your questions uh, through a later question session or through emails, as I said before. Thank you very much indeed.